Hello, it's me, Christine. Welcome to my little crime corner. I'm glad you're here. I think about this case all the time. Let's get into it. As you can gather from the title, we are going to talk about the kidnapping of Adolf Coors III. Adolf Coors III, who also went by Ad, was on his way to work at the Coors Brewing Company. His position was CEO and chairman of the board. So a little background on the Coors Brewing Company. You've most likely heard of this company if you are at all familiar with beer, because to this day, it is one of the more well-known beer brands. In 1873, the Coors Company was started by Adolf Coors and Jacob Schuler when Mr. Coors bought a recipe for a Pilsner-style beer from a Czech immigrant named William Silham. For this enterprise, Mr. Coors invested $2,000 and Mr. Schuler invested 18,000. In 1880, Mr. Coors bought out Mr. Schuler, and he became the sole owner of the brewery. It was the single largest brewing facility operating in the world. The first Coors Brewery was located in Golden, Colorado, which is where our story takes place today. At eight o'clock in the morning of February 9th, 1960, Ad made his way to work on his usual route, but he never arrived and no one was sure where he was. He was expected at work that day as he had several appointments and meetings. He only lived 12 miles away from the factory, so when some time had passed, his coworkers became concerned. His car was found with the engine still running and the radio still on by a milkman on the one lane Turkey Creek Bridge between his home and the factory. Police were called, and when they eventually came, they discovered a large bloodstain in the dirt. Not a good sign. They also found one of the lenses from his glasses, a baseball hat in a brown fedora, on the ground below the bridge. A local had said to police that he may have heard a gunshot, or what he thinks could have been a gunshot, since they were in what was considered to be a hunting area. At this point, police had put out an APB for him. No one had reportedly seen him, but they didn't give up hope. The following morning, he was still missing and his wife had received a typed letter in the mail. It said, your husband has been kidnapped. Call the police or FBI, he dies. Cooperate, he lives. The letter also detailed where his car had been abandoned. Included in the letter was a ransom of $500,000 for his safe return. They said, we have no desire to commit murder, we just want the money. They wrote that they would tell her later where to make the ransom drop. After the money was to be received, they said he would be released within 48 hours. At this point, I am a panic. So the family got the $500,000 together and waited for a call that would never come in. This was actually not the first time that the Coors family had to deal with a kidnapping attempt. In 1934, his father, Adolf Coors II, was the intended kidnapping target by a former state prohibition agent named Paul Robert Lane, along with a former investigator for the Federal Dry Forces named Clyde Culbertson. They also had two other accomplices. They had intended to kidnap him and demand $50,000 for his safe return. Police heard about this, and Adolf II actually volunteered to be kidnapped in order to apprehend the suspects. But this plot ended up being foiled by police, who were already working on an auto theft ring, and ended up arresting Paul Robert Lane on an auto theft charge. So the actual kidnapping did not happen. The family continued to wait for ransom drop-off instructions, and they told police that money was no object and that they would do anything for his safe return. At this point, all they really had to go on was the typed up ransom note Mrs. Coors had received in the mail. They first dusted it for prints, but that didn't turn up anything. The forensic document examiner noticed that the note was typed up very proficiently and contained characteristics that one would learn in a typing class such as a double space after the period. The letter was also error-free. The document examiner noticed that the specific typeface was made by a Swiss firm called CTAG, and he was able to narrow down two typewriter manufacturers that used this proprietary typeface. 
a Swiss company called Hermes, not Hermes, and a Dutch company called Royal Nickby, ultimately determining that the kidnappers had used a Royal Nickby typewriter. This one in particular was a very affordable, portable version, meaning that a lot of people had one or had access to one, so tracking it down wouldn't be easy. The document examiner did, however, notice that the typed letter indicated that the typewriter itself had a small defect. He had found that the letter S was in fact lower than all the other letters. This defect would be found on a particular device, so this was at least a lead. The police at this time were following up with a potential witness who said he had seen a parked car near where the kidnapping had taken place. He described seeing an early 1950s Mercury sedan with a license plate reading AT62. He said that he had remembered the plate because he thought whoever was parked there was there to disturb his mines, which were in that area. Upon a search, police were able to locate four Mercury sedans that had that four-digit sequence. With that information, the FBI followed up with each of them. They began looking at one man in particular who had bought the car just one month earlier named Walter Osborne. He had an apartment in downtown Denver that was completely empty by the time police arrived. Through building management, they had found out that he had moved out on February 10th, which was just one day after the kidnapping. Suspicious. In the dumpster behind the apartment complex, police had found boxes for handcuffs and leg restraints. The woman who had cleaned the apartment also mentioned that she had seen several guns in the apartment. One of the other tenants in the apartment told police that they often heard typing late into the night coming from that apartment. Suspicious. Walter Osborne had left no forwarding address and police had no clue where to look next. Luckily, no one was set to move into that apartment yet, so police were able to dust the entire apartment for prints, and luckily, they found some. They didn't match Walter Osborne, however. They belonged to a man named Joseph Corbett, who, in 1951, had shot a man in the back of the head, claiming it was self-defense. It's not self-defense if it's in the back of the head. Anyway, Joseph Corbett had been convicted of this man's murder, but because he was such a good prisoner, he was moved from a maximum security prison to a minimum security prison. And because he was in a minimum security prison, he escaped. The landlord who had rented him the apartment had identified him by his mugshot, so police were able to pursue this lead. They had learned that a month before the kidnapping, Joseph Corbett had bought the 1951 Mercury sedan and had kept it in a storage away from his apartment so that no one in the apartment complex would know that he had it or tell police that they saw him with it. They had found out that he had been working for the Benjamin Moore Paint Company as a paint mixer. And when speaking with police, his coworkers had said that in the days leading up to the kidnapping, he had made several incriminating comments. He had said to, watch the newspapers and something big is going to happen and then you won't see me anymore literally what kind of thing is that to say i say as little as possible to my co-workers like they don't even know my last name after the kidnapping joseph corbett just stopped showing up to work and no one from the benjamin moore company had heard from him again so again he had evaded police they then went back to what was probably the strongest lead at this point, the typewriter. They did know that there was only two places in town that sold that exact model typewriter that the document examiner had determined that typed the letter, so they investigated there. An employee at the department store actually recognized a picture of Joseph Corbett that had been presented to him by police. He said that Corbett had bought the typewriter four months before the kidnapping, and had somehow remembered that he had paid cash. How do you remember that? Despite knowing all of this, they were unable to locate Joseph Corbett or Adcors. Remember him? Yeah, he's still missing. 
Eight days later, in Atlantic City, New Jersey, police had found a 1951 Mercury sedan that had been doused in gasoline and left burning at the dump. The plates had been removed, but they were able to trace the serial number on the car's engine block and determined that the car was owned by one Walter Osborne, also known as Joseph Corbett. Because most of the inside of the car was destroyed in the fire, investigators looked at what remained on the outside for clues. They were able to distinguish four different soil samples, which would have helped them place the car and possibly get an insight as to where Adcors is or was. One of the samples they had determined had most likely come from the cross-country drive. Another sample was very sandy, so they had determined that that one had most likely come from Atlantic City or the surrounding area since it was a beach town. Another sample had matched up with the soil found near the kidnapping site on the bridge in Golden, Colorado. There were some differentials in the samples, and they thought that some of those particles could have possibly come from where Ad Coors was being kept, since it was made up of particles that matched that area of Colorado. 612 samples of Colorado dirt later. They determined that it was the same soil found on Pikes Peak, which is on the front end of the Rocky Mountains and 10 miles west of Colorado Springs, which is 80 some miles away from the abduction site in Golden, Colorado. Mind you, this is a huge area with all different types of terrain. There are also many houses, as well as mine shafts and caves. Basically lots and lots of hiding places. They searched and searched, but unfortunately, Adcors was nowhere to be found until eight months later, in one of the larger hunting areas, a human skull and bones were found. Investigators also found the clothing that Adcors was wearing when he was abducted. They also found a pocket knife that had AC the third engraved on it, confirming their suspicion that this was in fact Adolf Coors the third. Adolf Coors the third was found on September 11th, 1960, and his determined cause of death was two gunshots to his right shoulder blade, which in turn pierced his lungs. Edgar J. Hoover, the director of the FBI at the time, had called Joseph Corbett the most wanted man in America. Based on everything they knew at the time, it had appeared that this crime had been planned for months. He had bought the typewriter ahead of time. He's learning his schedule and his route to work. He knows when he's with his family and when he's alone. He knows where he'll be concealed from any witnesses. Joseph Corbett's picture ended up being published in newspapers and magazines around the world. So a lot of people would see his face and would hopefully help them to track him down. Investigators determined that he had pre-written and mailed the ransom note on the morning of the kidnapping and then had driven out to the woods to wait for Adcors to pass on his usual route to work as he knew he would. They believed that Corbett had staged his car to make it look like it had broken down on the bridge, which in turn would have blocked Ad. Remember, it was a one lane bridge. It is believed that Ad got out of his car to help Corbett and there may have been a scuffle based on the fact that his baseball hat and glasses lens were found over the side of the bridge. They believe that Corbett panicked when Ad had run back to his car, and it was then that Corbett fired his gun twice, resulting in Ad getting hit in his shoulder blades, piercing through to his lungs, killing him then and there. Police think that this was a panic response, and because things were not going according to plan, decided to dump Ad's body in the woods and then drive to Atlantic City to destroy his car. He evaded police for seven months until on October 29th, 1960, a woman in Vancouver, Canada had called police to say that a man who looked like Joseph Corbett was living in her apartment building. It did end up being him. And when police came to arrest him, he declared himself and went willingly. When going through his apartment, the murder weapon and the typewriter didn't turn up 
but they had more than enough evidence that he was the killer. Despite pleading not guilty at his trial, he was convicted of both kidnapping and murder and was given a life sentence. The law in Colorado at the time stated that unless there was a confession or a witness to a crime, they could not seek the death penalty. Although given a life sentence, Joseph Corbett was paroled and released on December 12, 1980. In the only interview he had ever given after his release from prison, he said he was innocent. On August 24, 2009, Joseph Corbett took his own life by a single gunshot wound to the head. <laughs> wow. I mean, you can try your best not to be attacked or kidnapped, but just be aware of your surroundings. Let people know where you are and where you're going and just be careful. Please be so careful. Don't stop for anybody. Stay in your car. And that is all I have for you today. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you learned something. And I will see you in the next one. Bye.